We're finally arriving at the last topic pertaining to the design forces for diaphragms. We saw the shear force demand for diaphragms, we saw the cord force demand for diaphragms, and now we'll cover the collector force demand for diaphragms. This topic is rather general, and most of what I'll say will apply to rigid diaphragms, but I'm saying here that this is for flexible diaphragms because some of the statics along the way uses the flexible diaphragm assumption. Shown here is our example building. We have a force of 120 kips applied to the diaphragm. This has been determined in another video. In addition, we have the forces delivered to the lines of action shown to the right of the sketch. This has also been determined in another video. For the section between lines C and D, we have forces of 27 kips at either end of that section. For the section between lines B and C, we have forces of 9 kips at either end of that section. And for the section between grid lines A and B, the calculations were a little bit more complicated and we have uneven forces of 26 and 22 kips on either side of that section. The question now is what are the collector forces that result from this? I haven't defined collectors for you. I think it's best to just go over the example and you'll see through the example what a collector force is. Shown in this diagram is grid line C. The thicker portion indicates the shear wall and the dashed portion indicates the rest of that line. So let's look at the forces that are at play in the horizontal direction. Taking the reactions that we already calculated, we know that that wall resists 22 kips that are delivered to it from the upper section and 9 kips that are delivered to it from the lower section. How do those forces get delivered? Well, those forces get delivered through the diaphragm. So the 22 kips gets delivered in a distributed force over the 20 feet of length that are available on that segment of the diaphragm. The 9 kips likewise get delivered by a distributed load over the 20 feet that are available over that section of the diaphragm. If we divide each of those forces by the 20 feet that are available, we obtain the value that's shown there. The maximum collector force is right at the end of that distributed load where all of the load has accumulated and that's equal to 31 kips as shown there. The collector then is that segment of the diaphragm outside of the shear wall where this distributed load collects where it accumulates to finally be delivered to the lateral force resisting system. The design force for the collector is that point in the collector where the load is the largest. Now in this case the geometry is very simple. The 31 kips are exactly equal to 22 plus 9, so this makes intuitive sense. Let's look, however, at grid line C. Again here the grid line is dashed, the shear wall is, is the solid piece, and we have once again the forces on the shear wall that are implied by the reactions that we already calculated. The 9 kips distributes over the 20 feet that are available to it. This is the same as in the previous case for grid line B. The 27 kips will distribute over the 30 feet that are available to it. And what we see here is that part of that distributed load gets delivered to the collector and then to the wall. Another part of that load gets delivered directly to the wall. So the collector isn't actually taking the full 27 kips from the bottom. Part of those 27 kips get delivered to the wall and don't have to be resisted by the collector. The values of the distributed load have been calculated just the same as before by taking the total force, dividing it by the available length of diaphragm, 20 feet above, 30 feet below, and we can find the collector force by considering those distributed loads to accumulate over the length that is not on the lateral force resisting element. So we take the 0.45 kip per foot from above, the 0.9 kip per foot from below, add those up, 
multiply by the 20 feet over which they accumulate, and we get 27 kips. When it comes to considering grid lines A and D, the calculation will be more complicated solely because there's more bookkeeping in terms of tracking equilibrium from portion to portion of the line of resistance. Before we get to that, we need to remind ourselves of rigidity and how the force distributes to the walls marked A1 and A2 and D1 and D2. Recall this equation for the rigidity that we saw in a previous video. This example has eight foot story heights, and if we take then the lengths of eight feet and 10 feet for these walls to plug into D, we can calculate the rigidity values that are shown here. Each of the walls will attract load in proportion to their rigidity. So walls A1 and D1 will attract 39% of the load as is shown here. Walls A2 and D2 will attract 61% of the load. In other words, the 26 and the 27 kips along grid lines A and D will be divided 39% and 61% to the respective walls. So now let's look at line A. Shown in this diagram is grid line A with the walls on the left and right side shown in dark and the dash line showing the collector, the remainder of that grid line. We have 39% or 38.7% of that load applied to wall A1, 61.3% allocated to wall A2. The 26 kips distributes to that line over the full 30 feet of diaphragm depth that are available to it. The approach here is going to be to divide this line into three different sections and see how the horizontal force accumulates as we go from section to section. First, we're showing wall A1 with the 10.1 kip force that we already calculated. We can calculate the resultant of the distributed load by multiplying by the eight feet of that wall. And then equilibrium in the horizontal direction tells us that the force that must be present there to maintain equilibrium is 3.14 kips. I'm keeping the units, I'm keeping the kips out of this diagram for simplicity. Let's look next at the dash segment that represents the collector. On the left hand side, equal and opposite to the force from wall A1 is the same force of 3.14. On the bottom is the resultant from the distributed load that accumulates over 12 feet. On the right hand side, we can calculate the force that must be there by equilibrium, and that's equal to about 7.3 kips. We'll move now to wall A2. We're showing wall A2 with the 7.3 kips equal and opposite to the collector force we just calculated. The 15.925 kips that's known from the diagram above, and the distributed load accumulating over 10 feet shown on the other side of that wall. We can add the 7.259 and the 8.667, and we can find that that's equal to the 15.9 kips on the other side. This last segment functions as a check. We're okay, and we can move forward. The largest collector force is the largest force on that collector element, which is the 7.259 kips. We've identified the maximum collector force along line A. The calculation for line D is similar, and I'll let you do that on your own. The value shown on the bottom, 7.53 kips, is the value that you would obtain if you did the same calculation along line D. You can pause the video now to try to confirm this value. Shown in red are the locations of the maximum collector force that we've calculated, and shown next to that are the values. What does this mean in terms of a practical design decision? If we consider the collectors on the perimeter, these saw a maximum force of 7.53 as determined by line D. We'll probably design these the same and we'll design them both to the force of 7.53 kips. This force is significantly lower than the collector force that we saw along grid lines B and C. For grid lines B and C, I would probably design these the same as well and design them out to 31 kips. This ends this large example pertaining to the analysis of flexible diaphragms.